Hi, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're getting ready to kick off the second part of, the, of tonight's session. And we're going to have a panel discussion with these three experts over here. But before that, we have some brief recorded remarks from Taiwanese Minister Chen Yuan Dong. Um, he's the Minister of the Overseas Community Affairs Council since 2020. And previously, he was Taiwan's ambassador to Thailand, senior advisor um, at the National Security Council, and spokesman of the Executive UN. Um, so with that, I guess they'll roll the video and then we'll start the panel afterwards. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very pleased and grateful that Director General Chen Yu Chen of the Taipei Economic and Culture Office in Seattle was able to demonstrate decisive action and leadership in planning and organizing this important meeting on high technology cooperation between Taiwan and the United States within just three months. We know that Taiwan and the United States have been important economic and trade partnership for decades. They mutually play complementary roles, with Taiwan possessing a well-established digital technology industry supply chain, while the United States has advanced capabilities for the development of high technology and massive international market. Therefore, Taiwanese companies in related industries are keen for opportunities to cooperate with the United States companies. Our Taiwanese American business owners can be an important bridge to enhance partnership between these two countries. Around 4,000 Taiwanese owned businesses have set down roots and prospered in the United States for decades. They have shown strong interest and willingness to assist Taiwanese companies and American companies to connect with each other in both directions in any way they can. I sincerely hope through today's meeting to see rapid further promotion of ever closer connection and extensive cooperation between Taiwan and the United States. Finally, I wish today's meeting very success and all attendees good luck, health, and happiness. Thank you very much for your attention. Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to start off by giving each of you an introduction. Um, here we have Tony Young. He's the technical director of the Next Generation Communication Technology Office of the Information and Communication Research Laboratories at the Industrial Technology Research Institute. Um, next to him, we have Chong Yu Feng. He's the general manager of BU6 at the Pegatron Corporation, where he runs networking, telecommunications, Internet of Things Affairs, and the Wearable Devices product series. Um, and then finally, we have Jeffrey, Jeffrey Yan. He's the director of technology policy at Microsoft Corporation, um, and he's working on examining disruptive technolo technology trends with policy implications and societal impacts. Um, so welcome all three of you to the stage. Um, so to get started, I, I was going to have each of you just sort of give an introduction to maybe your company or your, your position, what you're working on, and taking in mind what Minister Gong was talking about with digital transformation, maybe in your role, are there particular technologies you're working on that are driving digital transformation? Um, I guess we can start with you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you, Doc. I, I am Tony Yang from the E3 uh, Industrial Technology Research Institute. Uh, uh, E3 is a big family. We have uh, 11 research labs. I work for information, ICL, Information and Communication Labs. Um, in past three years, uh, uh, our team have been engaging in 5G technology and application development. Uh, 
uh, it's my honor to be here to do more discussion about the uh, Taiwan open land ecosystem. I hope you can understand uh, and understand Taiwan uh, capability more. Thank you. Okay, everyone. That's uh, uh, my name is Siwai Fan, and uh, I work for Pegatron many, many years. You can see my gray hair. So, uh, Pegatron is a company dedicated on the uh, design manufacturing for computer consumer communication products. And uh, um, uh, I would say that in 2021, uh, consulting revenue is around 47 billion. So, uh, pretty much, we have. Uh, worldwide, uh, very complete manufacturing footprints. So you can imagine that uh, when Doc mentioned about uh, digital transformation, that's very important for Pegatron whole company uh, strategy, especially based based on the next generation communication technology. So um, th thanks for Tom that uh, uh, from Microsoft that's uh, mentioned about Pegatron a few times. And uh, that, that's the project we work with Microsoft, especially for the digital resilience. And you can imagine that uh, sometimes we, uh, in some area or even in Pegatron facility, we have some disaster uh, emergent issue happens. We do not have right ground communication and we need some uh, very high reliable uh, communication system. So uh, we work with the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft side come up with the idea to uh, combine 5G uh, ground communication and satellite so that to make sure uh, the uh, very reliable and high performance communication system uh, when the disaster uh, happens. So on, on the other hand, you can imagine that uh, based on our, our Pegatron uh, uh, worldwide footprints, uh, we are going to put uh, 5G technology into our small factories. And, and well, I should say that we will put a 5G technology into our factory and become the basis of the smart factory. So uh, we are going to work with our partners. Uh, as a matter of fact, we work very closely with Intel, Microsoft, and uh, like a Qualcomm, uh, Marvel, uh, lots of the US partners. We uh, were trying to set up a very, uh, very huge uh, uh, network, uh, especially based on the uh, 5G uh, technology network. So that's a way we are going to work with our partner together is to make sure we can set up all this uh, um, uh, basis uh, for the future uh, digital transformation, then we can do the next. So I, I, I think that we will work on lots of partners and also the local telco companies. And uh, like in Taiwan, Zhonghua Telecom definitely needs our partner. So I think that uh, that's uh, pretty much our, our um, I would say, the path uh, to the digital transformation. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Yan. I, I'm, I come from a local small startup called Microsoft. Um, uh, we're really honored to be uh, invited here. Um, and we are pretty well known in the past for being a software company. And some, you know, in, in events like this, some people will ask, what's, what's Microsoft doing here? You're not even a telecom person or, or a company. Uh, which is quite true in the past because we were, like I said, a small software startup to begin with. But with the transition to cloud, now that we call ourselves a cloud company, we have everything to do with telecom now because without the telecommunication networks, there is no cloud or the cloud will be just really literally cloud up in the sky. It wouldn't land uh, as a service. So in the sense that cloud for us, uh, the, the 5G, 6G transition, the, the whole development of telecommunication networks is a, is a huge uh, enabler for cloud computing. Now, conversely, we also believe cloud computing is the key enabler of the new generation of wireless network like 5G or 6G. Without cloud computing, um, 5G or 6G wouldn't be a reality either, uh, including the topic that we discussed today, like ORAN. And that's because for the first time, I think, you know, the telecom network has 
under it's been undergoing a very fundamental shift from a very closed system to now be a very open distributed system and that really requires a lot of cloud computing um, facilitation and, and technology and, and business model for that matter so we see ourselves not only a beneficiary of you know 5g 60 6g development but we are also a huge enabler for this um, big you know transition and we have later on we're going to talk about you know you see what um has mentioned about the, the collaboration that we have been doing utilizing the microsoft solutions with uh, you know, Pagachon's uh, hardware and, and devices. I think overall, what, uh, what excites me is that 5G and 6G represents a huge opportunity for the Taiwanese ICT industry, which traditionally has been limited to being maybe contract manufacturing. But now with this, it opened up a huge opportunity and, and for us as well. So therefore I see a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Great, thank you all. Um, so I'm going to start out with some questions, but for the audience, I want you all to keep in mind, um, we want this to be interactive and use this as an opportunity to engage with our visitors from Taiwan. So after a few questions from me, um, if anyone in the audience has questions, please start thinking about these now, and I'm happy to turn it over to you shortly. Um, so with that, uh, Tony, you were talking about, um, your work on 5G and Open RAN. Could you talk about the current situation of these in Taiwan and what Taiwan's development strategy is for these? Hey, thank, thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to in, introduce uh, uh, 5G progress in Taiwan. Uh, the first that I, I would like to say, uh, the development in Taiwan is is more aggressive than 5G before, because we have a long we we the all operator in Taiwan we have a fire operator the all operator in Taiwan have launched 5G services since 2020, and the space one for private private 5G uh, will be released in the second half of this year, so the entity in in Taiwan can apply 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 for local 5G space one to to do internal use and uh, or public public service. So there are a lot of uh, uh, 5G application will will be implemented in Taiwan. And how, regarding the open RAN, open RAN, I, I think in, in my understanding there are more than 15 Taiwanese company involved in open land system development. In, uh, and I know, and we have a uh, one open certified certified uh, testing lab in Taiwan since uh, June last year. Uh, this lab also do security security testing also. So. Uh, I, I think Taiwan is, uh, it, we have a complete open range system. Uh, it's, uh, it's more easier for US industry to cooperate with Taiwan companies. Uh, I, I would say that Taiwan is a one stop, uh, open range, open range, uh, provider country. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, is that okay? Um, Jeffrey, I want to jump over to you, sure. and then I'll come back and see why with the follow-up question. Um, here. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe mine is running out of batteries. Um, so, Jeffrey, your team at Microsoft um, examines long-term disruptive technology trends. Um, and hearing Tony talk about 5G, 6G, and Open RAN, what type of disruptions do you expect to see these technologies unlock in the future? Um, and what do you think is going to, what do you think these technologies will really improve and what parts of them will gain, gain broad usage? Um, and here, I'll give you your. All right. Um, yeah, it, you know, these days, hardly, you know, almost everything is a disruption, you know. The COVID being big one, um, 
but when it comes to 5G, 6G, the way uh, we see it, it's, it's certainly a, you know, technological disruption, but more so I would say it's, it's more of a, um, a cultural disruption. And the reason I say it is, is this is where we see the closed telecom system meets the open, open internet. And that's why I say it's a cultural disruption because the open the internet culture, the way the system and applications are being developed, the way this, the networks interconnect with each other is rather different than the traditional telecom world. And 5G and 6G, arguably, if you compare uh, the 3G, 4G evolution, which is arguably predominantly a air interface upgrade, uh, which is really an evolution. There's not much change architecturally in the, in the network. But come 5G, it, there's a huge, I call it paradigm shift in terms of network architecture that what used to be closed, you know, a very tightly integrated software hardware bundle provided by a few telecom vendors, which are very prone, and I'm sure uh, companies like CHT is very experienced with, is very prone to vendor locking because the system is so much integrated. But the biggest disruption, in my opinion, would be now that system, both in the core network and in the RAN, are opened up for a more sort of modular, modularized and distributed architecture. And that means no longer a big boys game. Small companies or component vendors, that which Taiwan is really ex excellent at, can now play a much bigger role, not only just a contract manufacturer, not just a component or IC provider, but rather a solution and, 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 and even end-to-end -end provider. Um, but honestly, I think what uh, Minister Gong mentioned earlier today is that Taiwan, relatively speaking, is weak in the software software power or software experience. And, and the, the fact that this chip architecture does require a lot of software as the glue to, to still keep all the distributed component together. And I think that's where Microsoft comes in with our software experience with a cloud platform, which does the orchestration layer of the different components. And I think that's that's why we actually really excited. You know, part of the reason driven audit collaboration we have with E3 with Pegatron is that we are really really complementary in our core competence, and and the disruption really represents opportunity for companies like ours, and and I think for cooperation between U.S. and and, and Taiwan for that matter. Great, thank you. Um, so see why that. Sets me up perfect as I wanted to ask you more about the US Taiwan cooperation in these sort of emerging technologies in the ICT field. Um, I had seen that Pegatron recently announced an additional $50 million of investment um, on top of the already significant um, planned investment in the US. So, could you talk about what this investment's purpose is and what's driving this investment um, for Pegatron to invest in the US? Okay, that's uh, well. I, I think that um, one, of course, that's a very uh, customer oriented. Okay, because uh, uh, you can see um, in the future uh, some major uh, technology and also uh, corresponding products uh, will need uh, quite strong local support. And this kind of local services, including the manufacturing and also technology services. So that, uh, uh, for example, that uh, 5G or beyond 5G or uh, EV or high computing products, that um, uh, all this kind of the um, technologies strongly need uh, local support for the manufacturing and, so, and also technology. So, so for, for all all this uh, investment, pretty big portion will be kind of the customer oriented uh, uh, investment. Then that's uh, to make sure that we can cross the market 
and we can make sure that, uh, uh, our variable customers is fully uh, uh, very satisfied services. That's definitely uh, one of the key points. And on the other hand, I will very strongly align with um, uh, just Tom mentioned about Microsoft uh, CEO mentioned about tech, tech, tech intensity. Okay, so uh, that's also um, after our evaluation, we truly believe that uh, all of this future technology that uh, uh, we need to have a very strong relationship with our US partner. So uh, just again, like Intel, Microsoft, we definitely need to have the close a local team to work together. So uh, not only the manufacturing side, but also we, we, we are going to invest more uh, for the technology cooperation and, and also um, some other services uh, for our customers, uh, but also some other activities with our partners. Thank you. Um, and I saw I was um, researching your organizations and companies um, and saw that all three of you are collaborating in different ways. Um, so Tony, maybe if I come back to you, I, I saw ITRI and Pegatron were jointly working on a 5G ORAN end-to-end -end energy saving control system, which can be used in smart factories, hospitals, and entertainment venues. Um, could you talk about what that means, what this technology is, and how you guys are working together? Um, and what this is achieving? Oh, or either of you. Um. <laughs> By the way, I, I modified Jeffrey a little bit the <laughs> comments because we got uh, our very close flame from Foscom, from Combo, and also Pegatrons. All of these companies, it's uh, an up small. No. <laughs> we are, we are pretty, pretty. <laughs> okay, anyway, so I think that uh, uh, back to the first question that uh, Don, you mentioned about digital transformation. I believe all of these uh, technologies has come the same way, drive by these uh, digital transformations. So I think that uh, uh, 5G is a technology, it's a uh, uh, driving for the digital transformation, but on the other hand, digital transformation requirements also make the uh, 5G or, or the other new technology move faster. So it's kind of the, uh, quite uh, a necessity to uh, overall uh, industrial to, to make that happen. So uh, for example, that in these two years, because of pandemic, you can see that's quite um, strong um, communication tools and also collaboration um, uh, solution. All of this happened uh, in just two years. In before, probably we need to take uh, around 10 years, even more, to make them happen. So uh, right now, digital transformation definitely will be the one, just like the Mr. Gong mentioned, that said differently is the uh, one most uh, uh, driving force to make all of this uh, uh, happen in in this direction. Yes. Uh, I think the CY is too humble to to answer this question. Uh, uh, I think no, I I uh, usually cooperate with Pegasus to to de develop uh, the energy saving system for open RAN. Uh, we just got the 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 award from the small cell forum 2022 prize. So uh, the the system we we delight is to control the uh, the rain rain system. Uh, and, and we know the most of the power consumption is from the base station, or uh, most of the telecom power consumption is from base station. Uh, so if you would like to meet a couple free target or uh, in 20, by 2025, so uh, we we try to uh, monitor the, the data traffic from the base station and the terminal device. And so in the private network, uh, we can uh, shut down some base station. Oh, Shanghai in during the off-peak time period. 
Oh, and uh, of course, uh, our, the base station can be auto uh, power up or uh, turn on, uh, auto turn on to meet the cap capacity demand and application requirement. Oh, uh, this this system is controlled from the radio intelligent interface. Uh, this this is standardized from the and from the Orient Alliance, we totally follow this stand specification to deny our operating system. Thank you. So just so I understand, is that artificial intelligence based then? So it's monitoring the data flows and it um, regulates um, whether it's on or off depending on data flows? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Um, and that you were talking about base stations. Um, Director General Chun was also talking about some collaboration on low Earth orbit satellites, I believe, between Microsoft and Pegatron. Um, could you guys talk about what you're using that technology for? Um, either of you? <laughs> it's always deeper to see why first. <laughs> oh, I have to do that. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, uh, because. Taiwan is a very uh, um, special environment. You know that we, you know that we have a Xin, uh, Xinzhou uh, Technology Industry Park and TSMC, all of these famous companies uh, located in that area. But unfortunately, uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, we have quite some uh, nature issue. For example, the typhoon earthquake, quite a lot of that stuff. And uh, so uh, very beginning it's come up, uh, we need kind of a solution to make sure um, something happened uh, without normal communication system, we still can keep everything going. So uh, that's uh, with Microsoft's idea and uh, uh, we come up uh, uh, by using portable 5G devices uh, um, with satellites together, which means that uh, if the ground communication uh, is not available, that we still can uh, have this portable device move around and uh, very efficiently to the location and connect with the satellite uh, uh, to make sure the high reliable uh, communication happen. So in in this uh, overall application, you can imagine that 5G orient definitely is uh, one of the key. And on the other hand, we need to integrate a lot of things into a small portable device. Uh, for example, that we need to uh, put the 5G core network inside this small device, and we need to put on the CU, DU, hold the protocol stack into, and we need to have a kind of the um, uh, uh, thermal solution quite a lot so for the hardware side. Then we can come come out uh, um, reasonable uh, portable devices. So that that's a pretty much we can bring on for the system. On the other hand, uh, with this kind of portable 5G uh, system, we still need to connect with the satellite. And, and this satellite can link up with, uh, for example, Microsoft Azure uh, database. It's, uh, then all of this can be need to be uh, communicate smoothly. And so there, um, Microsoft also have a technology it's named uh, um, Edge, uh, um, Edge device to do the SDN uh, management for the remote side and also the cloud side to make sure all of this uh, communication goes through uh, um, smoothly and the configuration is easy. So um, so that, that's a pretty complicated, I'm, I'm not so sure, I'm not so very te technical guy, but it's a very complicated uh, 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 environment, but you need to make it very uh, flexible and, and, and uh, easy configurable. So then, Definitely into the crowd that will be come to Microsoft uh, area. So, pass to Jeffrey. Yeah. So, if I may add to that, I think this is a perfect example of how 5G and cloud enables collaboration across different industry segments, which otherwise may not even come together. So, in this case, with Pegatron, with Microsoft, and with SES, with the satellite company. 
together we we put a it's not a pure 5g solution it's not a pure cloud solution but it's just a amalgamation of different technology elements and many of you i bet most of you don't know that microsoft actually has a fairly new business unit we call azure space and we're not competing with nasa just to be clear but we are bringing cloud computing to the space uh, there's as part of Azure Space, we have a, a, a subunit called Azure Orbital, which does what it does is you can consider ground station for the satellite communication. The ground station is a key element, which, which happen to be a very expensive, very complicated system. Now, not every uh, enterprise or organization would like to build one, but now with cloud computing, you turn that ground station into a service, so what we call the ground station as a service. That's just one example of how the cloud is democratizing complicated technologies like supercomputers, or in this case, satellite communication to almost every enterprise, even small and medium enterprise. In this case, we're not utilizing the ground station just yet. It is simply a satellite um, ant antenna you know, receiving as the backup uh, backhaul for for the uh, uh, emergency communication. But this shows you that how the, the, the cloud, as I mentioned earlier, does the orchestration layer that binds different elements together to make a, a more holistic and more resilient solution. And the other the other thing, if I may want to add, this is what uh, Tony mentioned earlier about, you know, how you're able to uh, reduce the power consumption. I think that's a, another great example of how an open architecture allows you now to actually, you know, different uh, innovators and, 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 and companies to work on different components of the the overall like 5G um, ecosystem and find ways that which otherwise in the old days, uh, any telecom vendor would not allow you to access that level of data. Uh, the, the operators wouldn't allow you to do that either. But now I think in the 5G paradigm, uh, you almost have an API into every component of the network where developers can develop new and innovative solutions that the telcos itself may not even think of. But it, it, once it develops, it becomes either OPEX saving in this case or a new revenue stream. So I think that's, you know, going back to your earlier question, the, the inter disruption, and I think that that developer ecosystem, which Microsoft has kind of grew up with, like we we are a platform company, we are a uh, ecosystem company, and I think we're bringing that spirit, that that experience to the five G ecosystem, and to the benefit of both the the telcos and also the industry, like you know Foxconn and Pegasus, all the big companies. Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I'd be happy to take any if there are. Um, oh, yes, over here. Um, so, uh, so the online people can hear you. All righty. Uh, my name is Ulysses. I come from the Corner Cloud Technology. Um, I have uh, two questions I, uh, I, I would like to learn from the Microsoft Jeffrey, if I may. So my first question is that I would like to echo that you mentioned about 5G open architecture so that we can have the possibility to bring the software recipes into the communication world. So when we are having the software into the communication world, that means we can have the more complex, uh, complexity problems using the software ways to deal with it. Uh, so it, when we're talking about these aggregations, after these aggregations, it will comes from the automations. So uh, I would like to understand uh, how does the Microsoft as a software company, how do you foresee the role of, of the automations into the open rent or open architectures world? That's my first question. And my second question is that uh, we always know that AT&T and Microsoft is a very good successful case that the cloud providers work with the telco operators. But I believe there might be some I use the confrontations or the challenges when, when we want to blend the ITs into the communication world. So I was wondering if, we, if you can share some of the examples to us and how you deal with this. Thank you very much. 
Well, first of all, thank you for the really good questions. I'm actually afraid that this is going to be out of my depth, uh, but I will try my best. Uh, and simply because CY and I actually, you, we just realized we are colleagues from Nortel Networks from a long time ago. Uh, so I did come from the old telecom world. Uh, and I was talking to Guozhong from, from CHT. Like I used to work with CHT very closely as well. So sort of borrowing from that, my older experience, even though I don't have as much gray hair as CY, um, the way I will answer two of your questions, first of all, I think the fact that we disintegrated the 5G network architecture does bring a new challenge, meaning it used to be a closed system and you literally guarded with walls, right? The, the central office, nobody can get in, um, nobody can get near. And therefore, there's a lot of security around. But now all the network components are distributed literally globally. There's a lot of uh, uh, risk points where you know security issues like hackers can get in. So one of the amalgamation sort of need or, or protection is how do you protect an open architecture without compromising the security, the 5G security. So all of a sudden, I think the 5G security it's, it's a much bigger issue than the older 4G, 3G network, simply because it's it's now distributed and, and multi-vendor environment rather than a single vendor. And that's where I think why I think Open RAN has a huge dependency on cloud, both at the cent in, in the core and at the edge, because you need the cloud orchestration to make sure that every step, including even the supply chain, uh, your your supply chain, where you acquire those components from, need to see, satisfy all the security uh, certification policies, and, and in operation, you your cloud orchestration layer need to be able to orchestrate that security policy so that every element in that chain adhere to that policy. So I'm almost at, a, at, a, at the end of my depth. I'm no longer that technical anymore. So that's, that's hopefully answer your first question in some ways. The second question was, oh yeah, with AT&T. So a good, good friend from AT&T. That was a big, I would say, let me put it this way, that's a big bomb to the telecom industry, to the telecom world. Like, what? AT&T sold its soul to Microsoft? Uh, that's literally one of the journalist articles said when AT&T agreed to let Microsoft run its core 5G core network, not just its IT infrastructure, its very like heart of the AT&T network now will be run by Microsoft Azure network. And we went to extend the integration. It's not just a commercial contract. We went to the extent of integrating the team from AT&T, I think over 150 engineers that invented and, and built that core network infrastructure um, into Microsoft. So now they become part of Microsoft Azure organization, Azure for operators. And a common vision, again, is that both AT&T and NAS believe that's the future of telecom. It needs to be cloud native. And we believe so strongly that the set of core the cloud native core network capability can be made in such a way that not only AT&T can rely on it, every telco in the world, and I hope CHT will take a look into it as well, can actually benefit from this cloud native core packet core network. And that's just one part of the puzzle. I think the cloud uh, driven or cloud assisted open RAN is another example. So now you have core being cloud native, a distributed, and then you have open RAN. So all of a sudden, from a telco point of view, you no longer need to just buy equipment from one or two or maybe just three vendors, and then you're locked in. You, you have no other choices because that vendor's RAN only work with that vendor's packet core. There's no open interface. But with ORAN, now you can, in fact, pick and choose the best of breeds from components, uh, and then that literally is many more choices in terms of supply chain diversification, in terms of the, and, and you think of uh, the geopolitics of, you know, national security, then you can certainly afford to choose, not choose certain vendors. Let me put it that way, right? 
So that's that's kind of a long long answer to your excellent question. I hope I I, I answers to some extent. Yeah, thank you. Um, do either of you have anything to add to that, or you don't need to? <laughs> um, but if you do, I wanted to offer you the opportunity. Okay. Um, any other? Uh, yes, a question back there. Oh, from the uh, from the internet, from the virtual audience. Um, are you going to ask that, or? I'll... Oh, okay, great. Hi, can everybody hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Sang Song Fu from Pacifian. And uh, um, <clears throat> I do have a question regarding the 5G. Uh, 5G has the sub 10 gigahertz and also the mini mini wave of the uh, segments. So um, we know that the mini mini wave part actually requires a lot of investment into it, but it actually also opened the uh, a possibility, very good possibility for the future, in, including the imaging in the future as well. Also paved the road for the 6G. So I would like to understand that uh, from Microsoft point of view, uh, what kind of application beyond the communication can be expected from this one? And uh, what's, the, uh, what's the expectation from the uh, um, Software side, or maybe a, a big leader, technical uh, tech leader like uh, Microsoft today. Thank you. I'm not sure if I understand the question completely. You're asking about millimeter wave and what uh, what yes. innovation yes. comes out of it. Yes, or... yeah, specifically on the millimeter wave, um, okay. because that's uh, also associated the challenges on the five G millimeter wave part. And uh, of course, there's a lot of investment required. And uh, uh, beyond okay. that, she also rely on that. Okay. Again, I, I hope my colleagues here can help me because I'm is is beginning to really out of you know at a, at the rim of where my knowledge is. But I happen to also uh, uh, handle the spectrum policy for Microsoft uh, in certain range. So a lot of current five G developments are in the mid band. Uh, and particularly here in, in, in U.S., that's why there's a lot of debate on the C-band, because that's really the golden spectrum, not too high, not too low. But when it comes to millimeter wave band, it's, it's a sort of newer frontier. There's a lot, of, huge, a lot more spectrum available, but more challenging in terms of the range and uh, other things. But my, my, my view, and, and, and you know, certainly Microsoft is, we're not really... Uh, the strongest in terms of the spectrum, uh, because we don't really buy or use spectrum directly, but we do believe the millimeter wave band is very important for things like, you know, the short range communication, uh, either indoor or maybe to the, you know, from like, I, I believe a, a good friend of Facebook or Meta now called it, they do this thing called um, Telegraph, which is from post the telephone post to the building, so that kind of short range. So there's a lot of uh, uh, newer application, or in, in the other thing I should really mention is the AR, VR world, uh, where Microsoft has these things called HoloLens and many other companies have similar products. That will also require a lot of really high bandwidth, but short range communication, which I believe millimeter wave band is very suitable for it. And one last thing to mention, um, not to risk too much of my boundary of my knowledge, is that it's not just 5G or 6G. Like, minimal wave band is also a huge application for unlicensed technology like Wi-Fi. So you have 60 gigahertz wide gig, which utilizes the millimeter wave band, and it's available today. You don't actually need to wait for 6, 6G. Right? Uh, Wi-Fi... Uh, uh, it's it's a in our view Wi-Fi is a, it's a very important and very complementary uh, technology to the 5G 6G cellular technology, and we believe in the enterprise world especially. Uh, CY and I were just discussing that there could be a very good uh, combination of the two type of technology, both utilizing certain bands to provide uh, in total provide a much better connectivity in terms of throughput, latency, and, and uh, uh, I guess quali quality of service overall. Uh, see why I hope, uh, Tony, any of you want to add that? So, uh, 
So uh, maybe we will just provide, make the uh, 5G characteristics uh, even more clear. I mean, it's uh, normative from uh, high bandwidth and uh, low latency and uh, can adapt for uh, a huge connection. So that's a uh, minimum way of definitely make this, all of these characteristics uh, in uh, come up to another level. So, but uh, so from technology wise, we do believe minimum wave uh, should be the uh, right direction to move on. And of course, that's because of that, uh, uh, definitely all technology, including the hardware, software, will work in that direction. So, and that's for sure. But at this moment, uh, minimum of steer uh, compared with the sub, sub six, that's, uh, it's more expensive. And of course, that's, uh, uh right now to our application really need for the minimum wave, probably not so obvious. So because of that, uh, I think that uh, uh, we, we haven't pushed our current cost-effective power solution uh, to uh, meet the requirement for the minimum wave. So I, I think that still, still needs some gap. Otherwise, it's, uh, if we make the minimum wave happens uh, from today's technology, that definitely can be done without any problem. But Unfortunately, that uh, related to cost, everything probably not, not so affordable. So that's uh, so. I think that uh, uh, once we we push for that direction, and uh, I, I believe the hardware side definitely need to be modified. On the other hand, I believe soft side probably need to do some modification, some modify as well. So I think that's my that's my opinion. Uh, I, I, I talk a joke. Uh, some people say the mini 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 way is too fighty because he have a, a lot of bandwidth and low latency. He can meet a, he he can uh, he, he can meet a IMT IMT twenty twenty standard. Oh, but uh, we have a lot of technical challenge to have to be recover to solve. Oh. But some application running on millimeter way, we, we have a lot of uh, application test field. Uh, as Jeffrey said, uh, some application like the AR VR or NR, AMR with the AR camera and the AOI in manufacturing. So some have a lot, uh, some, some application need, need a high capacity bandwidth and the low latency, I think it, we have to uh, use millimeter way to achieve it. But uh, we need uh, some innovation application to, to be developed more. Yeah, thank you all for your responses there. Um, we're running low on time, but I wanna, I guess I tend to approach these things more from a policy angle um, and I'm not as in the weeds in the tech um, aspects. So I wanted to maybe wrap it up with another question on U.S.-Taiwan cooperation. When you're looking at the policies of both country and sort of the innovation strategy um, and tech policy, are there certain areas where the policies line up and really facilitate cooperation on certain technologies? And are there other areas that are maybe um, less easy to cooperate on or could use some policy improvements? to better facilitate cooperation on certain technologies? Um, and if so, I'm just curious about like what technologies or what areas of cooperation really um, work well. Well, uh, I'll start. I, I do wear like a policy hat. Um, I, I'm more like a half cup full type of person. So I, I would say more of the, you know, the, the ample areas for policy collaboration between US and, 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 and Taiwan. Um, and I know that there, there, there have been ongoing collaboration or exchange of information of best practice between the Federal Communications Commission with the National Communications Commission, FCC and NCC. Um, 
and maybe uh, Jiao Tongbu as well, right? Um, the uh, one area I certainly think, given our topic is 5G, 6G, is definitely spectrum policy. And uh, FCC, I have to give a lot of credit to FCC, the US regulator being at the forefront of a lot of uh, spectrum innovation. I think if you think back 1980s, when FCC first opened up uh, unlicensed access to Wi-Fi band at 2.4 gigahertz at that time, everyone thought that was just garbage band, right? It was, it was just like left over, nobody really wants it, so let's give it to the, to the, to the industrial science and you know, the, those experiments. It turns out, you know, 20 years down the road, how big, you know, we all know, and I don't want to quote numbers, but it's billions and billions of Wi-Fi devices and hundreds of different kind of innovation and, and, and Wi-Fi itself becomes such a complement to the 3G, 4G world in terms of, for example, cellular offloading, in terms of the indoor coverage. So I think that is a good example of how the regulator, how policy actually allowed innovation to happen unexpectedly, right? Nobody really predicted the success of Wi-Fi. Um, and in the same way, I think the Federal Communications Commission did a great job in opening up federal spectrums like CBRIS, the citizen broadband um, um, uh, services. That really is another brave step forward, I would say, because uh, you're dealing with the military. And who dare to share or, or request the military to say, well, share your bandwidth with me, because that's national security and everything. But I think both DOD, the Department of Defense, and FCC, and NTIA, the federal uh, administrator for the federal uh, spectrum, they did a, a really brave and really innovative job by opening up that federal, the Navy radar spectrum for uh, civil usage by way of you know a uh, what they call the AFC, really the automated frequency coordination database. So, so that's how you use a technology to solve a a really complicated, you know, somewhat political uh, uh, sort of dilemma there. Because you, you you definitely don't want to mess with the navy, right? But you also don't want the spectrum to sit there idle for most of the time. And the success. You know, I think it's, it's still at uh, the beginning stage, but I think the growing success of CBRS is another example of how uh, the policy has actually allowed really good innovation. And now that, that's a very US specific, but I think other countries are looking at a similar approach. So I would highly commend FCC and recommend NCC to kind of have kind of, you know, same kind of philosophy towards spectrum sharing, for example, because ultimately we talk a lot about sustainability today, right? I, I, I would say the spectrum as a resource in itself has a huge sustainability challenge, because if we continue to do the way we manage spectrum in the past, we are already running it out. And we, we all heard of the spectrum crunch, this notion, but we do believe with, you know, sharing and with uh, dynamic access, for example, the spectrum is an infinite resource. You can't really exhaust it as long as you use it smartly. So, and that requires our governments, our regulators to, to, to really be innovative there. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I, I, I will pretty much, <clears throat> sorry, I will pretty much take another view uh, for product development side. Uh, because at this moment that uh, I believe that uh, all this uh, 5G or beyond uh, 5G uh, technology definitely need kind of the using uh, you, our U.S. partners uh, strong technology wise, but also need Taiwanese needs company like uh, Pegatron or even Guangda, Fascom, Combo that uh, uh, development efforts to come up with overall system. So I, I strongly fear that uh, when we develop all these kind of pro uh, products um, uh, because of the freak, uh, spectrum uh, restriction, uh, we there is quite some difficulty move the people, move the products or move, move the environment around 
And uh, it's, uh, for example, that we are very difficult to have the test environment in Taiwan. And we, we could definitely need to come to US to do something else. And uh, if that's uh, just like the Jeffrey mentioned, if there's FCC or NCC, they can discuss to come up kind of the sharing concept, then allow the uh, Taiwanese company to be more uh, flexible to have such flexibility to let Taiwanese company to do all this development job that definitely would be good for our, for all the system company like Bangda, Foscom, Combo, Pegatron. Definitely that's, uh, that's the way. And also that would be very helpful for all the um, companies that intend to do this. And on the other hand, I also uh, would like to uh, um, kind of, because of this, especially like the satellite today, it's a very new area. And uh, if US government can, for example, the FCC can put uh, Taiwan as a kind of priority position to make the satellite services launch in Taiwan, that's, uh, and uh, to to help uh, local uh, Taiwan local operators to have the, this kind of experience to run in for that, I believe it's different that will help a lot. One moment. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so, did you have anything to add there, real quick? Sorry. Uh, I, I think I, I have a three situation of uh, for. But for U.S. and Taiwan cooperation, mm. then first one is I I, I would like, um, uh, it, I would like because most of the open five G open end system developers cooperate with U.S. solution vendor, including the Intel, Qualcomm, maybe and Nvidia and so on. So. Uh, because the uh, open range right now is uh, in developing phase, we really and the uh, Taiwan industry invest a lot of lot of in this uh, segment. So, uh, would I, would I, would I would like to suggest uh, if uh, if uh, U.S. solution provider can provide better better and competitive solution. To all range system vendor, it would be would be would be better for us to for for Taiwan industry to to compete the legacy system because as you know right now we have a, a power consumption and performance issue in open range system. We, we need the U.S. support to 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 suffer this problem or improve this problem. This first one. The second one, I, I think, maybe maybe uh, we can cooperate in application, including the uh, from the operator side. I think the five G H application is important because it's a, we call the it's a new opportunity to telco. He, he can provide a distinguished application different from the OTT vendor. Or, or, or cloud vendor, because uh, uh, actually because in the near customer, he can provide the uh, low tenant latency and high, 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 high bandwidth application to customer. So he can distinguish the application from the OTT vendor. So I think it's important for uh, for telco. So I think we can cooperate with uh, maybe with the uh, OTT vendor Microsoft also. So you, I think. You, Including the Microsoft, AWS, even Google, they provide the edge application solution and based on your public API. I think a lot of uh, edge application, a uh, lot of uh, innovation application running on your standard API. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, OTDS can co cooperate with the operator to create new new revenue. This, 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 the third suggestion I would like to say, uh, because in open end system, uh, we say the open end, the certification and the uh, integration is essential for open end system. 
So uh, I, I would like to promote uh, our, our, our Taiko, Taiwan ecosystem because right now we have a, a certified open learning a testing lab in Taiwan. Also, if, if US Telco uh, can teach you or guide us uh, to do more tests uh, 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 well, regarding the what we call the uh, carrier acceptance system, uh, we can base the operator requirement to do more test item to meet the uh, uh, telco telco expectation. Uh, it, it will speak our 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 our, our, our system uh, uh, it, it, it our system to ship uh, open lane to to Telco. Oh, this is my suggestion for her. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Um, we are over time. I think we have an audience member who's eager to ask a question. Um, I could offer her this, and maybe if you guys could just give real quick answers, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Rita Chen. I'm uh, on behalf of U.S. Department of Commerce. So it's our great honor to work with NDC to this uh, town delegation to the U.S. So I just want to answer your question about the dialogue between FCC and NCC. So AIT commercial section, actually, we already arranged two times conversation between these two parties for two years already. But uh, because we are kind of on demand basis, so we received a request from US companies such as Intel, Qualcomm, and Microsoft. Uh, the two conversation in the past this year and last year was only focusing on Wi-Fi 6. So now I heard there's another issue on the 5G spectrum. So if that is the case, we need some uh, U.S. company to raise the issue to us. Then U.S. government, we could step out because we could not proactively to, to do that kind of approach because U.S. is a kind of government driven. And also, i like to know the reason why we organize this big delegation with all these excellent private sectors and um, and the Taiwan key policy makers from Taiwan authorities is because we received a policy from U.S. Department of Commerce last year. We were demanded to uh, form the binational 5G applications between U.S. and Taiwan because uh, U.S. government uh, uh, think Taiwan hardware is so strong and U.S. software is uh, also play a key role there. And we want to form a new technology to form a new turnkey solution. So the telecom world will not be dominated by Ericsson and Nokia anymore. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, after this event or if people you continue to Trip to Select USA, you can meet lots of, uh, uh, you can meet a representative from 50 states and they can tell you how to find a local partner, local SI, if you want to join their tenders locally. And of course, please partner with Microsoft and Hegatron. So to form the solution, because this is part of our AIT's mission. We want this binational solution to be exported back to the US. And when it's mature, we, we sell it back to ASEAN countries. And AIT, we hope you can sell them to Africa as well. There's my section chief, Brent Onda, who work in Nigeria. So he, he hope we could help that country as well. So if you have any question, just let us know. And uh, it's very delighted. Oh, can I have one more question? I received some requests from US uh, SME companies. They want to develop, uh, sorry, my question is for Tony Itri. They want, they want to work with Taiwan uh, company for this new 5G, new open range, but uh, they don't understand. They, they don't know if they need to work with the SI locally. So maybe you can answer this question for all of my U.S. clients. Thank you. Uh, SI, Taiwan SI will work with the Taiwan SI company? Yeah, because they don't know if they can, for example, if they just, uh, their software. And, oh, why I read this question also, because I held two times 5G event in AIT in Taiwan. And uh, it's a similar U US soft company, Microsoft was there, and we have a 
lots of people were there. And actually, the VIP from FastCon, they asked, uh, yeah, we love to adapt this, you know, open rain, but they, they like to have one SI to deal with um, multiple vendors. They don't want to, you know, um, run off their energy just by contacting different vendors. So they asked me, where is the SI? And I don't know how to answer them. I can always tell them, go to Zhonghua Telecom. <laughs> or, so. Uh, I, I, I say before, but, but I say Pegasus is a professional or an SI vendor. <laughs> Maybe you can act more. <laughs> more. I, I, I say the certification and indication is very important for Orange system. I think the first step is you have to get a Orange certification for each subsystem, including software. So the, all, 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 all the all, all the software and hardware have to meet the Orange Alliance specification. This is the first step. Uh, the second step, uh, we have to interoperability between the each, each subsystem. Oh. Uh, if you finish the, your whole system, end-to-end -end system, uh, you have to uh, send, send, send your system to telco to do the, as I said before, the carrier acceptance test. So, so there are three three parts, and uh, the, finally we have to field test in telco. And there are a lot of more testing to do in, in telco. So that's why I suggest uh, uh, maybe if possible, if because a lot of uh, Oren vendor in Taiwan, if we if we can uh, cooperate with a sub vendor from the US, they can install their software in in co cooperated. Uh, Taiwan hardware vendor and and test to certification IoT testing and even more the carrier acceptance in Taiwan lab directly. I think it will it will show the it will show turn the turn wrong way. Uh, if you you finish the all the test, I think the, the all the SI are easier to pick their partner. To cooperate, uh, and uh, even even the operator, they have a lot of different vendor and, and ecosystem to to reduce their operation cost. That is my my my, my reply. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we're well over time, so it's time to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Seattle once again for putting this event together. And many thanks to Tony, Siwa, and Jeffrey for joining this panel and sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.